Lucy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Welcome, Machinima fans. My name is Ricky Lee Grove, and I'm hosting this episode of And Now for Something Completely Machinima. I'm here with my pals, Phil Rice, Damien, and Tracy Harwood. Hello, everyone. Hello. Now, last week we did Fake Science, which was a classic Machinima. And this week, we're going to have a really interesting film that Tracy chose, which I think will bring up an interesting topic of the growth of Machinima. Cinema Tools, because this is a fairly modern one. Uh, Tracy, you want to share the film with us? Absolutely. Um, this is called Forbidden Planet, Children of the Krell, Chapter One, and it's by Philip Brown, or, or, whom we, we probably know better as Big Trek. He's somebody from the older days of Machinima as well as um, the one that we were talking about, Dead on Cue, last week. Um, it's actually based on the original Forbidden Planet movie of 1956, and it's an animated, stylized sequel is how he's described it, set immediately after the events of that film. Got to say, I don't remember the last time I saw that film, so I watched a few snippets of it, and I and it brought it all back. I probably knew it off by heart, I would have thought. It's been written and directed by Biggs, um, who's clearly a, a massive fan of the uh, original film. Um created an iClone uh, and he's used things like character creator audacity sony vegas acid uh, adobe photoshop i mean all sorts of different tools have been used in this um and he's also worked um or used content from a whole load of folks in the in the community as well which is was also great to see he's used voiceovers <laughs> from more modern tools, Eleven Labs, um, sound effects. And he's used various different sources, including um, free sounds uh, and also a bunch of old CDs for um, special effects, as I believe it. I really love this. I, You know, it, it really reflects that kind of 1950s sci-fi genre, all those kind of crazy blurbs and bleeps that you remember in the film. Everything from the way the starship looks, you know, the classic saucer shape and the way that the characters talk in this sort of almost clipped, uh, clipped way, very sort of correct clipped way. Um, I'd say English, but it's not English at all. <laughs> it's got a very homemade feel to it, almost feels like a puppeted uh, film. It feels like you should be able to see the wires holding the... the um, <laughs> You know, hmm. holding the starship yes, yes. kind of thing, but sort of the marionette, the marionette theater. Yeah, it feels a little bit like it should. You know, you should be able to see that kind of thing because it's got that kind of feeling to it, and and the way that the you know the characters look as well is very very um, clearly uh, stylized animation. It, it felt a little bit sort of um, Captain Scarlet and the Mysterons and sort of Joe Ninety and various others in that kind of genre for me as well. I really love the storyline to it. Um, in fact, I got so into this, you know, it's 14 minutes long. I just lost the sense of time and I was really ready for the next bit of it. I wasn't ready for it to end when it did. I just I just wanted the story to sort of carry on in this unnamed planet that they kind of landed to. So I really can't wait for the next episode, Biggs. You better get on with it because um, there's somebody that's very keen to see it. Uh, I think... Um, much of what you see in it, though, cleverly, isn't really a direct copy of the original, which is interesting because it's it's closely linked and closely inspired, but not that close that you kind of think, well, that's just a ripped off character. It's just re-saying the same thing that the old character did because it isn't doing that. The only thing that I thought was a bit closer was Robbie the Robot. And particularly when you kind of got the sense of the Rolodex brain ticking, up, you know, clicking over that you, you remember from the original film. So um, mm. I think that was a particularly interesting part of it, of how the, the characters themselves have been 
adapted slightly. I think there were some really great references to the original film as well, which made you want to go back and have a look at the original film. For example, um, the fact which that... Which is great. It, yeah, exactly. And, I mean, it was a real love letter to the original film, wasn't it? it you know, the references to to Dr. Nor- Morbius and the, the plans left by the alien computer system for Robbie. You know, what happened to Quinn uh, on Altair 4 and, and all those kinds of things. You really want to remind yourself of of the, the details in the original story. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just got to... I've probably got to dig it out and watch it completely. I didn't watch it completely. I'd also completely forgotten when I was digging around with it. I'd also completely forgotten that Leslie Nielsen <laughs> played J.J. Adams. I didn't know that. I couldn't remember in that. In his prime. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, I only remember him in He's things like He's a suave airplane. dude. <laughs> he was so cool. He was, wasn't he? <laughs> completely forgotten that. And obviously, Dr. Morbius, Walt, Walt Pigeon and what have you. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, you start digging around and you suddenly realise and and reflect upon this as well. What a massive impact that original film had on Mm -hmm. science fiction cinema. You know, it was the first science fiction film to depict humans travelling faster than light. So, you know, you've got a Star Trek reference in there. You've kind of got um, different planets orbiting each other and different solar systems and this this robot character being a character rather than just something running around you know there was a lot of interesting things that were going on in this original film and i i love how biggs has picked up on some of the uh, the detail of it but i especially liked the electronic soundscape that he's designed for his version wonderful. of the film wonderful Absolutely wonderful. So, the soundtrack, I've got the soundtrack on L- LP, on vinyl, yeah. and occasionally pop it out to listen to it. It's just remar- remarkable. Yeah, well, okay, that's my, um, that was my pick. What did you guys think? Uh, okay, uh, I, like you, realised that I haven't seen this film, the original Frozen Planet, in such a long time. I remember the first time I watched it, I must have been about six or seven years old, and the, the <laughs> creature in it scared me <laughs> so much that... Um, I had nightmares, but then I watched it again when I was a bit older and I loved it. And I've seen it a few times since then. So I, I think I need to go back and watch this again. So I watched this and, and then I thought I need to, I don't have time to watch the whole film then, but I watched the trailer on YouTube just to get a feel for what that was like to remind myself, what was the visual style of it? That it fresh in my mind. And I can see that big Tech's mm. done a really great job of recapturing that atmosphere. I think the, um, a stylized look for the characters is a good choice. It was something I thought about doing for Air to the Empire, but it turns out I am absolutely terrible at creating stylized versions of real people. <laughs> so they didn't look anything like uh, how they did. So I, I have to applaud Big Trek for his skill there because you, you look at the characters and, and you look at the, how they did in the original film. Like, yeah, I know that it's meant to be. So that's a good choice because uh, you're trying to create actual realistic versions of the characters that's also really hard and if you get that wrong it looks really wrong as well so um yeah star is a good choice and uh, yeah i do applaud his skill the recreation of those characters i, I really like the story i want to know what happens next so like you tracy i, I want to expect to uh hurry up with that second episode because <laughs> i want to know what's going to happen although it's supposed to be time to to catch up on the original film as well so i can remind myself I got a rough idea. Remember what happened, but have it you know fresh in my mind. So yeah, this is a really great choice, and uh, I really liked what Big Strike's done with it. So yeah, I yeah. too had had when when I I started watching, and I thought, oh yeah, I've seen. Of course, I've seen the original of this. Well, I, I hadn't. Have you? <laughs> I saw Robbie the Robot, and I was thinking of Lost in Space, which oh. is. Yeah. which contains a very similar, if not the same robot. I don't know if it's intended to be the exact same no, one it's or a, what. No, it's a completely different design, although the, the outline of it is the same. Yeah, this it was similar enough to where that's what I saw and thought, oh, I've seen this, and I loved, I grew up watching the old Lost in Space as, as a kid, so I thought, okay, cool. And so I enjoyed the, the you know his rendition and, and, and thought, okay, I, I really want to go back and re-watch the original. And the the original is on Tubi, t u b i dot com, which is a, a a streaming service that offers movies for free. It's ad supported. I I assume it's available in the UK. It's definitely available in the US. So if you want to go see the original, it is currently on Tubi, uh, and it's definitely worth watching. 
And as I watched it, I realized, okay, I haven't seen this. I haven't seen this somehow, uh, in spite of the fact that I'm I'm one of the world's leading nerds. Uh, I just hadn't seen it, and I loved it. I mean, le again, Leslie Nielsen was the lead, as dashing as you will ever see him. Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone knows L Leslie Nielsen from Police Squad and the Naked Gun movies and stuff like that, where he that was kind of his act two or act three of his career, right? But yeah. He was quite, quite a good leading man and dashingly handsome. And he's opposite Anne Francis, who was, a you know, just one of those beauties of the day. And, oh, it's just wonderful, wonderful movie. And and it's it's a 50s movie in every way. Like there's moments of cringe for a modern viewer. It's like they're. They're talking about this guy's <laughs> daughter right in front of him, yeah. like 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 their their tongues hanging out, you know, uh, like like in the cartoons, auga, you know, right in front of her dad, and he's just like, yeah, I know, right? She is, she is pretty hot. Like, What's happening here? So there's that aspect of it that's just really entertaining to me, but but then it's it's just a really, it's a nice. I don't know if it would be considered a hard sci-fi story, but it's a good sci-fi plot and there's an interesting sense of mystery to it and then yeah basically it, it appears that that big streck's movie picks up right after the events of that um and you're right damien i think the stylized characters was a really good choice stylized is very hard to do as you know as 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 we both know uh, but maybe it, i guess the advantage would be that it's a little more forgiving if it's not exact that like like you mentioned, Damon, you could tell who was supposed to be who. Um, and if it, there, there's a there's a risk that if you do the characters that are supposed to look exactly like their real life counterparts, that if you don't get that just right, uh, it almost trips off the uncanny valley effect, right? Right. So right. That's a tough choice to make because Damien, you know from experience that doing the ones modeled after real people are tough. Yeah. That's really hard. Um, but maybe there are more tools built into the iClone pipeline that make that a little bit more straightforward to achieve with things like the headshot plugin, right? Where you can actually take a photo and map it onto the model that, that without tweaking, that doesn't get the job done completely by any means. Mm, right. It, uh, it at least can get you part of the way there. Right. And with the images available from when the film was made, you know, the cameras weren't that good. So you're not going right. to have high quality photos of the cast. Yeah, I don't think there's a photo set out there of Leslie Nielsen from every angle, is there? You, know? <laughs> you could probably get so, him from Naked Gun, but then he's going to look a lot older than he did A little bit different, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah, I just loved this movie. I wasn't particularly close to Big Trek at the time, but this, this film started up a conversation between he and I, and we've been interacting on... I found a new friend, basically. I guess us Phils have to stick together, but uh, yes, uh, it's 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 just one, a wonderful achievement. He is actively working on uh, the next chapter. Yes. Um, he's not not delaying at all. He's working on it right now. So, and we none of us have mentioned yet, but the response on YouTube to this has been incredible. Mm, wow. Worth well north of 40,000 views. Yeah. And this is a film that was released, what, six weeks ago, maybe? Yeah. A little over a month ago. It's just astounding. And yeah. in, I don't think anybody's more surprised about that than him. <laughs> He's very humbled by it and also is taking it as motivation to continue. So, Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. very exciting. Uh, Big Trek, we we know from back in the day, uh, most notably his... Um, iClone picture that he did, uh, Haunter of the Dark. Is that what it was called? Mm -hmm. The Lovecraft. Yeah, right, right. You were involved in some of the production on that, and so yeah, mm -hmm. that was just a that was just a uh, knocked our socks off at the time. And so, yeah, he's been at this a long time and has really, really gotten to know his way around the iClone tool set. And this is this is really good stuff. It's not perfect, uh, but uh, it. Dude, what it gets right is just so good and it definitely nails the vibe and the theme and he makes use of those sounds uh from that era that are just just wonderful so yeah uh, yeah just you, the only reason this wasn't my pick is tracy beat me to it so <laughs> I'm sorry phil. great no it's fine it's fine i worked with phil brown on haunter of the dark and i can tell you that he is a very detail-oriented person. He likes to get things right. Uh, he's a thoughtful filmmaker. Honor of the Dark was a 
wonderful experience. I was inspired to work with him because he did another Lovecraft shot in the movies, which I liked a lot. Like, I'm sorry, but the title of that particular film escapes me. I'm sure uh, Tracy will be able to figure it out. But I wanted to work with him and turned out we could. And uh, the result was something that I was very proud of. I'm glad that he's he did this adaptation. My favorite thing about it was the script. I thought that he was he knew the original film really well, and he was able to come up with a plot that um, that, that really caught the style, as you all have pointed out. Uh, the style stylized version of it, I think, was an excellent choice. I do have a couple quibbles. All of you have covered the the positive things about it. And, I mean, and he just, by the way, he deserves the accolades he's getting for this because he's been working in Machinima for a long time, as you point out. But there were a couple of things that kept me from enjoying it as much as uh, the rest of you. And that was the textures on the models had that clay look mm -hmm. um, that has always bothered me. It always kicks me out of a movie. And it's a, I, I clone had that problem with, from the very beginning these clay textures that were smooth and uniform on every person. And they finally got around it eventually by doing headshot and coming up with better ways to texture it. But um, Big's use of sort of his stylization approach brought back the same problem with textures and also animation at times with jerky. Now I know part of that was his stylization, but the jerking of us of it got in the way sometimes for me to stay in the story. I I didn't have the same experience you Tracy had of time not passing. I, that doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it. I did enjoy it very much, and I'm really happy to see it. But I kind of wished he had done some color grading uh, for this to overcome the texturing. Da Vinci Resolve, the, the uh, film editor that uh, Phil and I use, has some really extra. Uh, default color grading schemes, and I he probably didn't edit the film in Da Vinci Resolve, but I think color grading would have helped avoid that uh, uncanny valley for me texture look on the uh, the characters. Also, so, at times, I think he spent too much time on medium shots throughout the film as opposed to wider shots. I didn't do a count of it, but it. Because I wasn't involved in the story, I paid more attention to the details of the shots. And I I thought it he could have been a little more creative on his camera work in it. But then again, he was trying to ape the 50s style. So they didn't have a lot of camera, different camera point. But I was really glad you picked it. I enjoyed it. I'm glad to see he's getting his due finally. And uh Congratulations to him for Biggs. I think that's great. Uh, last thing I want to say is that Lisa and I, my wife Lisa and I have a little joke from Forbidden Planet. In the middle of the film, Morbius, I think is the name of the guy, stands on a big bridge in the middle of the, the huge uh, area that he's in. And he points down and he goes, 500 miles. Then he points up and he goes, 500 miles. And I always come up to Lisa and I say, 5,000 miles, 5,000 miles. And she says, no, stupid, it's 500 miles. It's a little <laughs> joke that we do because yeah. we, because I got it wrong. So I, now I always get it wrong. Yeah. But uh, that original film, and, and the final thing I want to say is that if you make a sequel to a film that leads you back to the original film, you've done a, the right job on it. Yeah, yeah. And cop copyright issues are interesting because that was one of my first thoughts is that he might have copyright issues. But from 1929 to 1963, the copyright uh, standard was if you didn't renew your copyright in that period of time, it became public domain. Right. So I think maybe Forbidden Planet didn't renew their copyright on it, hmm. which allows him to be able to do a sequel to a major. I'm I'm not sure of that, but I think that's why he it's still staying up on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Well, I wanted to add a does. couple things. I wanted to add a couple things, Ricky, as well. Um, on the uh, the color grading, it's a very good idea. Um, for well, for Biggs or for anybody who's 
working with iClone in particular, if you don't use DaVinci Resolve and maybe feel like, well, I don't really know what I'm doing with color correction and color grading and stuff like that, uh, iClone has some, and I'm not sure how they're pronounced. Is it LUTs or LUTs? L-U-T or stands for lookup tables. LUTs. Basically, I always thought it was LUTs. I okay, LUTs. Basically, there's a whole set of them that I think, if they're not part of the uh, default package in iClone, they're a reasonably priced add-on that you can get that will basically apply those film looks right within iClone, and they are stunningly good. And there's a lot of variety there. Those presets that you were talking about, Ricky, that are in DaVinci right. Resolve. If for some reason you're, new, you're using another editor and you know don't have access to those, or if you're a little intimidated by DaVinci Resolve because it's not a, uh, it's not easy. There's there's a learning curve with DaVinci Resolve. It's completely doable. It's achievable. But if you just try to dive right in and download it, and okay, now I'm going to color correct. It may not be immediately intuitive what to do. You need to watch some videos and have people show you. But that's an alternative for specifically for people using iClone that there are some LUTs built right in that are quite nice that might be uh, to, useful for that. I want to add to mm -hmm. that. You can import your own LUTs into iClone. So if you find some free ones online, you just import the file. Oh, so uh, LUT, is, a, is it a standard of some kind then? That, yeah. That, it's, okay, it's, I was not aware of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not um, terribly well lot. educated on color correction at all. So, no, I only came across it in uh, iClone, and then I started looking, looking through. And I thought these are good, but I wonder if there's more out there and how yeah. does it work. So I looked up. Oh, it's quite a common thing across video editing, right? But yeah, Neat. you can. It, it, there's um, you go online. There's lots you can buy, and then there's free ones that people <laughs> have just made to share. So you just find some you like. If you want, just want the, the free ones, you can just load the file, just click on the, the import button, I think it is, or wherever it is in iClone, I can't remember, um, and you just load the file, and it's so easy. So, you know, it's the built-in ones. That's good to quite, know. Yeah, it's the built-in ones aren't quite what you're looking for. You can, you know, bring your own in. Very Color cool. grading is all over modern videos and modern oh, television yeah. and movies, and it's, a, it's, it's so easy learning. to use. Yeah. It's worth learning, and as you guys pointed out, it's fairly simple, but you can drastically change the mood or the uh, scene quality by adding a lot to it. Uh, yeah. Perhaps, Phil, you and I, we might should, we might get together and do an episode, a special episode for a completely machinima on color grading that would be fun it would be a fun result. video episode because we could actually illustrate some of what we're talking about yeah that's right let's, let's talk, plan let's to talk do that. about that okay. okay the other thing <laughs> the other thing i wanted to mention was uh the the clay face because that's something that that you and i both observed back in the day uh i think in like the machinaplex times so early you know in the fairly early days of iClone, but when it was starting to evolve into, you know, more of an, of a, of an animation platform. And that was a common thing that we would see in films for iClone. I know what it was for is when, when evaluating stuff for the expo and submissions with iClone, it was very common for them to have that clay face thing. But at the time, what we had observed about what it was that was tripping that off for us wasn't as much the texture of the face, although I think I think that might that's valid for for this film, but it was the the lack of uh, eye movement. The, and and in this one in particular, you notice it with the captain. The eyes are fairly wide the whole time, and there may be that's blinks right. in there. I I don't know, but not enough. And that's right. Nobody ever actually looks by moving their eyeballs. It's all like this, and then there's not a whole lot of facial expression too. Um and. It, I don't think that that that's that's as lacking in uh, Phil's film, but that was a common thing in iClone, and I don't remember why because at the time I didn't use iClone. I don't know if it was just that iClone couldn't do that, or if it was that the people making films with iClone didn't think to do that. But it makes a big difference, and especially if you're going to do any close-ups at all, uh, you want a little bit of of realistic activity there. There's no better way to illustrate that a character is, let's say, thinking than with the way that they're moving their eyes and not just eyebrows, but the actual eyes and variation on how wide the eyes are open, yep. you know, between a, a squint, it, it can make an amazing amount of difference. You know, a, a, a super close up can show just, we observed this in a film. Team Fortress, yeah. Uh, several episodes back, uh, the one that was the, the make, the remake of the Carl Sagan thing, it closes yeah. with this shot on the female astronaut and all you see is from like 
the bridge of her nose up to here. But you could tell that she was that she smiled, even though you couldn't see her mouth. That tells you how powerful the the animation around the eyes can be to to convey things. And that's not just true in super close ups, but otherwise as well. So some of the clay face thing may may be solvable by a little bit more uh, attention to eye movement, which modern eye clone mm. definitely can do. Definitely does. Yes. Yeah. They yeah. solve that problem. It's just that quite his well. Choice, in fact. Yeah. yeah. His choice in, in stylizing the film brought back that particular issue. That's the only sure. thing. Sure. And that is an issue that he's he's uh he's not unaware of. So I'm I'm interested to see uh uh you know what tweaks to the approach he might take in the next uh next episode. Anyway, it was it was I'm glad you brought that up Ricky because that is a uh a common thing and and I guess the the thing is is in modern iClone there's definitely a solution for that. I don't know for yeah. sure if in iClone 5 you could do that or not, but you certainly can now. Yeah. Well, obviously, forty thousand people didn't have a problem with it, so I yeah. guess I'm yeah. one of the few that actually do. But then again, our purpose here is to point out things like that, so I felt Absolutely. like I should. No, no, I think I think it's good, and I bet I'll bet he appreciates it too. We don't really, as filmmakers, we don't really get uh, meaningful feedback as often as we'd like. People in a YouTube comment generally are not giving you a dissertation on how to improve. Yeah, They're, that's true. It's a, it's a drive-by shooting thing, you know? <laughs> As a filmmaker, it's worth getting someone that you can trust to give you some decent feedback. Oh, it's to huge. Because um, when I was started using MovieStorm, uh, I I showed uh, one of my friends I worked with on Chronicles of Humanity. She helped me write it. I showed her, I, re I did a scene and I said, what do you think of this? I'm going to use it for Chronicles of Humanity. I said, well, that looks a huge improvement over The Sims, but your faces don't move. You got the mouth moving, but that was it. I thought, oh yeah, I didn't even think about it. But she gave me that feedback. So then I started looking into Movie Storm, which obviously has much more limited features than iClone, but it had abilities to still make face face movement. So I went back and redid it, and I showed it a few days later. How about this? I said, no, that's much better. So you need someone who can do that. Yes. Um, you know, and give you a kicking when you're forgetting to do something important absolutely well it's well the eye stuff that point phil pointed us particularly uh essential because as babies all we do is lay in our mother our arms and look at our eyes all the time so even though people may not know what it is they're experts in be being able to determine authentic eye real eye movement and uh if you don't get that right in animation it makes it really hard to make your characters believable think about this too the eyes are fascinating because think about this you can be standing in a room with someone across the room from them and you can tell what they're looking at like if you tried to calculate that with trigonometry or something it would be really difficult to calculate but we just can <laughs> know instantly if we're talking to someone and they're looking at a spot of mustard on their chin, or if they're looking at my scalp instead of my eyes, right. or uh, you know, if they're looking at my ear or something like that. It's amazing precision, these instruments, not just what we can do with them, but when we see someone using their eyes, we can we can instantly calculate what they're looking at with with startling accuracy. So that's mm. that's something to keep aware of in in film as well. As you as a director, you've got full advantage to use that uh, yep. to 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 manipulate that and and make it really precise so i'd like to you close know, with a, a brief funny story but rick have you got sure, please go right ahead all right so about three or four years ago uh, i had a local guy want to hire me to do some uh animated videos and his original they were training videos or corporate training videos and he had done them with this very primitive 2D animation that looked like something out of a 1970s PSA type of thing or something. It's like, I want to bring it into the into the modern age uh, and, you know, do some 3D animation with it. Well, the only tool that I had at the time, this was right when I was kind of coming back for this current wave of my productivity. I hadn't gotten iClone yet. Uh, well, I had iClone 7, but I hadn't learned to use it yet. So I decided to do it in MovieStorm. And so I created, he gave me some tests to create and I created some of these recreating the action of these videos that he had done, but with MovieStorm characters. And then I submitted it to him. 
And I waited for feedback and I waited and, and I waited and finally kind of shook the tree a bit and said, uh, so what, what do you think? You haven't told me anything. And he says, well, I've, I've showed them around uh, to, to some other people that I'm working with and they all agree with what I say. And that is there's too much uncanny valley effect with movie storm. It looks too <laughs> realistic. <laughs> That's the first and only time I've ever heard someone say that about movie storm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I ever heard them say too realistic. So yeah. You do one of them again in iClone and just send it to them and say, what do you think of this? Is I'm this... Te it's tempting, but it was years ago and I've uh. lost, I lost the job, but oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, he may have just written you off as the uncanny Valley guy. Right. Yeah. I'm just way too advanced. I'm like, I'm like the Ian Hubert of, of machinima or something. Right. It's like, that's just too yeah. real. Yeah. He can't it creeps me out. You're off to Hollywood next. So he can't possibly yeah. afford you. Of yeah. course. Of course. <laughs> well, that's it for this episode. Another really excellent choice, Tracy. I always enjoy the films that you pick and great discussion. Phil and I are going to do a little tutorial on color grading through uh, DaVinci Resolve. So stay tuned for that. Also, any relevant notes, um, links, uh, maybe a little bit about Big Trek will be on our blog at, hey, I remembered it, completelymachinima.com. And if you have any comments, talk at completelymachinima.com is the email address to use. We'd love to hear from you. We'd like to respond. Perhaps we'd respond on air. It may not be a friendly comment that we would make on air, but we would make a comment. <laughs> no, that's not true. I'm just joking. Well, that's it for the show. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Phil, Tracy, and Damien for your comments. I'm Ricky Lee Grove, and that's our show. Signing off. Bye-bye.